Hello, I'm David Brenner, the Vice Chancellor for Health Sciences. Thank you for joining us. And I think we have a really interesting um, discussion. So the topic of today's health talk is managing pain and its relationship to um, addiction. This is a complex and very interesting problem and chronic pain affects um, virtually everyone during the course of their lives. So the way the program is gonna go, it's gonna start with um, presentations by our panel of experts and then we're going to switch to a live question and answer where um, we'll field um, questions and we'll have our panelists respond. So our first panelist is um, Dr. Ruth Waterman, our chair of the Department of Anesthesiology. Um, Dr. Waterman oversees clinical care and department operations for anesthesiology in La Jolla and Hillcrest and all of UC San Diego Health. Um, she, besides being an established um, clinician and educator. She is also um, does research that includes the study of stem cells and stem cell-based therapies to help patients with pain. Dr. Waterman is also one of our most esteemed women leaders in the School of Medicine, and she's a champion about advancing um, women faculty members and encouraging women students in medicine here at UC San Diego. Um, Dr. Waterman, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your kind words, Vice Chancellor uh, Brenner. I really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who can make this talk today. Um, I have some exciting things to talk about with respect to the amazing department that I have. Um, and while I know there's a lot of focus here on opioids and addiction and alternatives, um, a lot of what I'm going to tell you today will um, help um, with respect to us understanding more how we can have a multimodal or many pronged um, uh, uh, attack of pain within the uh, field of anesthesia. So, you know, 175 years ago, um, it was um, Oliver Wendell Holmes who in the ether dome at Mass General coined the phrase anesthesia. And since then, um, anesthesia has just moved on from just being uh, a way for patients to quote unquote tolerate um, uh, the surgery. Now there are many things that the anesthesiologist provides to allow for the patient to have a very safe um, and you know overall pain-free um, surgical experience. Um, just you know to exemplify here, we've moved a long way from the days of dropping ether on a patient to using these large machine machineries, um, which you can see there on the right, um, that can carefully titrate the anesthetic gases and help us monitor the patient during surgery. And all of this is to say, you know, we still have a long way to go. And part of the reason why getting care at UCSD is so important is that we are using a whole bunch of the advances that our researchers and clinician scientists are undertaking on a daily basis. And I want to tell you a little bit about our exceptional clinicians who are using a bunch of the new discoveries that we, we are doing on a daily basis here at UCSD. So one of the Wonderful things is that as the chair of a department, I have about 100 uh, clinicians and researchers um, that work with me. I get to see and hear about their work every day, and I could go on and on, and I love talking about my, my faculty and interacting with them and understanding what they're doing and what they're bringing uh, to the field of anesthesia. For example, I have Dr. Veronica Shabayev, and she is studying gender differences in pain perception, and she's found a gene that will allow us to target um, gender-specific uh, pain relief. Um, Dr. Fadl Zidan, he works in mindfulness, and he's found that after just four sessions of uh, mindfulness meditation, patients experience less pain. Um, Dr. Laura Case has been using weighted blankets um, to help with anxiety. We know that the number one psychological predictor of someone having post-operative pain will be whether or not they um, have anxiety um, as, you know, just at baseline. And using weighted blankets um, will allow us to have to use less anx um, anxious uh, or anxiety and, uh, medication before we go back to surgery. And one of the most exciting things that we're doing in the lab right now is uh, under Angela Meyer, who um, is looking at the effects of anesthetics and whether or not um, they can affect different infections and inflammation um, within the body. So imagine that if you had a specific cancer, or if you had diabetes, or if you had a particular infection, um, and we knew which anesthetic was the right anesthetic for you um, to give you the best outcome, I mean, it would completely change the whole um, face of how we provide anesthetic care. We're also doing a lot of stuff in the clinical arena. 
Um, we provide orthopedic surgery uh, like no other here. We have great orthopedic surgeons who are doing amazing surgeries. And we also have an acute pain service and a regional service that helps us provide anesthesia like no other anesthesia group can do here in the Southern California area. So our patients all receive spinals if they're getting a hip or a, a um, um, knee replaced. This allows the patient then to uh, need a less overall anesthetic. It decreases the chance of them getting deep vein thrombosis, allows them to walk uh, more quickly after surgery, and is associated with less uh, blood transfusions in the OR. We have an acute pain service that follows a patient postoperatively, ensuring that they aren't um, you know, having pain and allowing some patients to go home with catheters that will provide local anesthetic for up to three days, um, again, decreasing their chances that they're gonna need so many opioids. Our acute pain service under the direction of NG Saeed has also shown that by doing a multimodal approach, they are able to get patients out of the hospital faster and use less opioids overall. And for patients who are undergoing mastectomies, we know that if we do paravertebral blocks, which are shown on the right of your screen, and we give the patient propofol during surgery, that they have a less, uh, less chance of having a recurrence of cancer and have a higher chance of being alive five years post-cancer. Uh, so these are huge things that our anesthesia department is involved with and allows patients to receive the top-notch care here in this, the San Diego area. But what I'm most excited about is innovation and the future that we're looking forward to. And part of that is through the use of bioinformatics and predictive medicine. Right now, we've um, done preliminary studies where we've been able to associate a gene with patients um, who may require long-term opioids after having a hip or a knee replaced. By, by being able to screen patients through pharmacogenomics, this allows us to target patients and help them preoperatively um, in determining and setting the stage for how we're going to get them through the next few months. We're also working with some of our surgical colleagues um, in um, determining what's going to predict post-operative pain in certain uh, patients um, and allowing us to collaborate with other departments. So our future is bright. I love working with my clinicians. You will be hearing from one soon, Dr. Mark Wallace, who's amazing and world-renowned in his field. Um, and um, you know, if you have any questions later about this, I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Waterman. That was, that was fantastic. Um, my, next, it's my pleasure um, to introduce um, my, my friend and colleague, um, Dr. Steve Garfin. Um, Many of you know Dr. Garfin. Um, he has been um, he was chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery for 22 years. He now serves as the interim dean of the UC San Diego School of Medicine. Um, dean Garfin is internationally recognized as an orthopedic surgeon specializing in um, adult spine um, problems. Um, he provides treatment for people with um, back pain, sciatica, neck and related arm hand syndromes, and other conditions related to the spine. Um, his work has contributed to the development of current international standards in surgical care of the spine. Um, he has helped develop many of the currently used techniques for advanced um, surgical spine care. He is consistently um, elected as a um, top doctor in San Diego Magazine, and um, he is um, internationally known for his um, contributions in um, clinical care and um, education of um, spinal surgery. So please welcome Dr. Steve Garfin. Thank you, David. Thank you for that very nice introduction. I, I don't have any slides, uh, so you're stuck with looking at me. Uh, all, of our, all of our patients who come into orthopedics, uh, particularly in spine or hips, uh, come in with pain. And that, so that's what we're, we're dealing with. <clears throat> and the, what we have to know is the not so much the pain medications, but the natural history uh, of patients who have spine-related pain um, and what to expect and what to anticipate. People tend to be very scared when they get back pain. Um, and we understand that some of your thoughts are that something's broken, like a soft bone fracture, or you have cancer. And so we, 
we, we try to allay that fear just by getting the history, getting x-rays and as needed an MRI scan. Our mainstay of pain treatment is in fact time. Time is our ally. Uh, the pain, unlike cancer pain, unlike fracture pain, unlike infections, is not a pain that says stop, it just says ouch. The, so we, we, we try to separate the anxiety uh, away from the patient uh, with some reasonable expectations. And I'm, I'll talk to you now as if, as if you were a patient. And there, there's certain categories we divide people up into, patients up into. There's back pain, <clears throat> there's leg pain, and there's a lot of questions in the pre-questions about neck, neck pain and arthritis. I'm gonna put them all together. Um, we know much more about low back pain and we know much more about leg pain in terms of duration. So back pain is something we don't, and neck pain, midline pains, um, is something we don't know a lot about in terms of where it's coming from, but we do know that 80% of the population will have some severe back pain during their lifetime, 25% will have recurrences, and the vast, vast, vast majority will get better on their own. Uh, we use anti-inflammatories a, lo a lot if you can tolerate it. Um, Over-the-counter is what I like. We don't use much narcotics uh, because the pain can last for months and we don't want the narcotics to last for months. If it's acute debilitating back pain, we may add uh, steroid medication pills that you can take for a very short time, like four days or five days. That tends to break the acute pain we tend not to use a lot of muscle relaxants. So for pure back pain, if we can feel there are uh, knots or muscle spasms, we will add anti-inflammatories, uh, physical therapy, and again, time, that's the ally. Surgery often doesn't have a significant role in treating pure back pain, uh, particularly in uh, middle age individuals. Leg pain is a little different. Um, it still tends to resolve and starts to, res if it's coming from pinched nerves in your back, I'm sorry, whether you're, whether you're younger and have herniated discs or of older age and have what's called spinal stenosis. But, but both of those we can usually manage without surgery, though surgery in those conditions uh, is very good with an 85% chance of leg pain relief. And again, I'm separating out the two. Um, with, with back pain, the improvement starts usually within weeks. For leg pain, it may take weeks to months because it's uh, a different mechanism. It's something rubbing a disc, pinching a disc, a uh, nerve, I'm sorry, or irritating the nerve. So in addition to anti-inflammatories, we sometimes will give um, narcotics for short term, there's other drugs um, that gabapentin is the common one that alters some functions in the in the brain in terms of sensation, sensing pain. <clears throat> we may try what's called epidural steroids. Instead of pills by mouth, we do it by shot uh, around the nerves in the spine. We do not do that. Our anesthesia pain colleagues uh, do that. And we, uh, in terms of sciatica, if 100 people come in, we may operate on one or two of them because the majority will get better with that regimen. Again, it's anti-inflammatories, it's time, it's activity alteration, may include steroids, whether by pills or a shot and physical therapy. Those who don't get better uh, fall into yet another category because we do then consider surgery. Some of those, if they come in on heavy drugs, usually it's not uh, started by us, we will send them to a special anesthesia clinic that we have at UCSD where they're looked at uh, before surgery with planning on surgery and making recommendations for us and in fact the anesthesiologist who will be caring for the patients intraoperatively. <clears throat> Other than that, um, we will try to stop anti-inflammatories a week or two before surgery and with surgery, uh, for whether it's leg pain or arm pain, 
we have an expectation of 85% chance of getting better for the leg and arm pain, uh, maybe only 70% in terms of the back pain that's associated with it. Interoperatively, uh, th it's all managed by anesthesia, as Dr. Waterman said. Um, Postoperatively in the hospital, we give patient controlled analgesia, which tends to be narcotics. Uh, and if we are having trouble maintaining control with the standard medication, the anesthesia service has yet a, another service um, for intra-hospital pain management that we consult. And then at discharge, we give people the medications they need. If we do a fusion, we don't like them to take anti-inflammatories because it uh, can affect the fusion healing rate. So we really are stuck with narcotics because there isn't very much outside of that. Um, but usually that severe pain ends in four to six weeks with the fusion, uh, four, to seven, six, four to six days uh, for herniated discs and spinal stenosis. So the majority of pains with the assist, assist of the anesthesia pain service we can control without heavy narcotics, which we hate to get into. Um, and we tend to refer them to the anesthesia service for guidance or their primary physician, uh, because our pain is, uh, and our surgeries and our treatment is quality of life, uh, not, not life and death. So there are different issues uh, we have to consider and the length of time people hurt can vary. So we like to keep them off of narcotics if we can. So I'll be glad to answer questions uh, later. That's exactly what I tell patients uh, when I see them when they come in with their pain complaints. Thanks, David. Thank you, Steve. I think that was, that was really interesting. Um, the next speaker is going to be um, Dr. Carla um, Marenfeld. Um, she is a um, board certified addiction psychiatrist who specialize in treating individuals with substance use disorders and co-occurring mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression. Um, she has um, provided um, medical oversight for UC San Diego's health intensive um, outpatient program for addiction treatment where people with a substance use disorder or another uh, mental health condition um, receive comprehensive care in an outpatient setting. She's an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry her research looks at health outcomes for individuals with substance use disorders and involves monitoring implementation of evidence-based practices in treatment of substance use disorder. Um, prior to coming to UC San Diego School of Medicine in 2016, she was an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University. Please welcome Dr. Carla Marinsfeld. Hi, my name is Carla Marienfeld. I am a clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry here at the University of California, San Diego, and I'm also the medical director of our addiction recovery and treatment program. Today, I'll be talking about opioid use and differentiating that from an opioid use disorder, as well as some treatment options that we have. Um, before we begin, though, I'll talk a little bit about some of the trends in opioid use and how we got to a point where we have so many people who struggle with this. So it seems like you can't open the newspaper these days without seeing something about the opioid crisis, opioid overdoses. And while COVID-19 certainly has replaced a lot of our focus and attention, the two are actually quite intimately tied because as we've seen with COVID-19, people have lost a lot of their structures, their support networks, some of the things that they did that helped them to do better and to have some resilience and coping mechanisms. And so what we're seeing with COVID-19 is actually both an increase in substance use for many people, as well as relapses for people who had struggled with substances in the past. We see these interesting rises where we see early on the increase in prescription uh, opioid use, and we still see pretty high rates of prescription opioid misuse in this country, although we've certainly seen gains in that from various interventions. Once they started making abuse deterrent medications um, that were supposedly to try to help limit the use, uh, we saw people transitioning more to cheaper, more readily available forms of opioids, including heroin. And so that's where you see that inflection point in 2010. And then in 2013, again, with that desire to have cheaper, more potent highs, unfortunately, the U.S. heroin supply started to be 
combined with fentanyl. And fentanyl has a much narrower window of safety. And so that's when we really saw that dramatic uptick, if you see in that dark blue line there of opioid overdose deaths in this country. So how did we get here? There are a number of different factors that led to where we're at right now. Uh, pain was something that was initially asked about, but it wasn't really incorporated into medical care in the same way until we start seeing it as something that should be included being asked about when we're doing vital signs. Um, we had pain scales where we were asking about people about their pain. And of course, if you're gonna ask about something, then you wanna be able to provide treatment. And so we had different treatments that weren't all based on opioids, but then we had concurrently this extensive marketing of opioids as very safe, uh, as not having the addiction risk that they were thought to have. And this resulted in a very dramatic increase in opioid prescriptions. And when you have this dramatic increase in prescriptions, you have a lot of opioids that are, that are available in our society. So it was increased exposure for a lot of people who were having these prescriptions, as well as a lot of availability, even for people who didn't have the prescriptions. I think it's really important to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about an addiction. Uh, this is the definition from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, where addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. And I think that really captures how complicated um, and important it is to consider all of those aspects that lead up to the experience of having an addiction. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences, right? So the person doesn't necessarily continue using because they enjoy it. And in fact, there's often negative consequences, but they can't stop. And that's the challenge. Prevention efforts and treatment approaches for addiction are generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases. This is a critical point because when we look at any sort of medical illness, look at diabetes, hypertension, and we look at relapse rates and we look at people who achieve their goals, we see similar levels with addiction. And this is contrary to many people's understanding of addiction because in fact, many people who have struggled with addiction do get better. And it's important to remember that. There's something called the addiction treatment gap where only about 10% of the people who would benefit from addiction treatment services actually are able to access them and use them. So the 90% of the people out there who are struggling with addiction, unfortunately, don't have the benefit of some of the, the medication and therapy options that we have that are really helpful for people. We have several components of treatment, many of which are therapy-based, including things like motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, group-based therapies are a big part of what we do in addiction treatment. And this is a very important, powerful agent of change for people. We also have a lot of free community-based groups like AA and Smart Recovery that are very important and can be very helpful for people as they go along. And then of course we have the medications, which I'll describe. So what happens when somebody is using opioids to when they start developing a disorder. And we often will see that they you know, are using the medications and they get into this cycle where they feel good when they take them and then they start feeling bad when they stop. And if you talk to anyone who's used opioids for a long period of time, you will inevitably hear this story about how it transitioned to, I was feeling good when I took these at first and now I'm just taking them to feel normal or now I'm just taking them to prevent feeling the withdrawal that's so terrible. And the withdrawal really is a pretty miserable experience and people will find themselves doing things they never thought themselves capable of doing in order to prevent it. And so they get sort of stuck in this vicious cycle. And so the idea behind several of the medications that we use to treat opioid use disorder is changing from that cycling of I'm going through, I feel okay, I feel withdrawal, I feel okay, I feel withdrawal. I'm stuck in this cycle. And you can imagine how that impacts your ability to work, your impact impacts your ability to be a parent or just to function and feel okay. To this idea that if we provided a certain amount of baseline level of opioid receptor stimulation, that they could just kind of feel normal without that cycling. When we think about options that we have for 
management of opioid use disorder, we have the behavioral therapies that I mentioned. And in addition, we have three medications that have been carefully selected to help minimize any risks that we have with the opioids that are being misused. And so we have methadone, which is a full opioid agonist. So it acts on that opioid receptor system, but it's not uh, given IV. It has a very slow onset. Once people become tolerant to it, they don't feel any kind of a euphoria or a high that makes it at high risk for misuse potential. And it doesn't have a lot of over, it doesn't have a lot of overdose risk when people are taking it. And in fact, it can be protective if people use other opioids on top of it. Uh, it can be protective for an opioid overdose risk. Buprenorphine is what we call a partial opioid agonist. And so it acts on that system, but it has a ceiling or a limit to what it can do. And this makes it much safer, much harder to overdose on. And then it also has those properties that methadone has where uh, it, once you become tolerant to it, you don't feel that high or euphoria. So the misuse potential is lower. And naltrexone is interesting. It still acts on the opioid system, but it's what we call an opioid antagonist. So it actually blocks the receptors. And it's an important medication um, that when taken orally didn't seem to have a lot of benefits, but now we have a new once monthly injectable version of it uh, that has been shown to be helpful for opioid cravings. And so none of these medications is perfect, but they've all been very carefully selected to try to minimize some of the risks of uh, what we see with opioids of misuse. And so that's why we, these were carefully chosen to help treat opioid use disorder. So the medications that we use for opioid use disorder are really important for a number of reasons. They have a lot of benefits to patients' lives, including returning to work, improved functions and relationships, decreased risk of infectious diseases, um, decreased risk of crime used to pay for substances, as well as improvements in their overall functioning. We also see an important outcome in the overdose risk. Um, so mortality is a really important outcome. And when we look at the patients who receive these medications, we see a huge benefit in the reduction for overdose risk. So in summary, we see both opioid use and we sometimes see the progression to an opioid use disorder. And it's important to be able to think about how we talk to patients and recognize when opioids are causing a problem in their lives. We have very good treatments that are available for patients with opioid use disorder. And the treatments for the opioid use disorder can improve people's lives. And this is very, very rewarding to watch as a physician to see this happening um, based on things that we can't take credit for. Um, I'm just the, the facilitator providing these medications, um, but it's very rewarding to see somebody coming in, not doing well, who feels like they get their life back as a result of the therapy treatments and the medications that we're able to provide for them. So with that, thank you very much. And I look forward to talking with you in the question and answer session. Thank you, Dr. Marinsell. Um, our final speaker um, is um, Dr. Mark Wallace. Dr. Wallace is an anesthesiologist who specializes in multimodal pain management. Um, since 1996, Dr. Wallace has been the program director of UC San Diego Health Center for Pain Medicine, which is dedicated to reducing and eliminating suffering and improving function in individuals. Um, under his leadership, the UC San Diego Center for Pain Medicine was named a Clinical Center of Excellence in Pain Management. Um, Dr. Wallace is also Chief of the Division of Pain Medicine within UC San Diego School of Medicine's Department of Anesthesiology. He is a leader in um, development and the practice of um, um, pain management and has conducted um, and is still active in multiple clinical trials of investigational drugs and techniques for managing chronic pain, including the use of cannabis. Dr. Wallace. Thank you, Dr. Brunner, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to speak at this. Um, so I, we're gonna, I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit. Um, we've been have, have more broad uh, overviews and I'm gonna really be focusing on two emerging therapies. Uh, one that is in very early development, which is the psychedelics and then another, which has actually had quite a few years of experience here at UC San Diego, which is, is, is cannabis. So to, to start off, I wanna put this in perspective because when we talk about you know, something like cannabis and psychedelics, like psilocybin, 
the question comes up and says, well, we all know that there's this opioid crisis and we know that we had some problems with using opioids chronic, to treat chronic pain. So are we trading off one problem for another? These are drugs of abuse. They can be abused. But if you look at the lethality of these two drugs, extremely low. In fact, there's never been a reported death from cannabis or psilocybin. And if you look at this at the bottom, at the top is, is, is cannabis and psilocybin, which has the least toxicity of all of these drugs of abuse. Whereas you look at the opioids, methadone, codeine, cocaine, even alcohol, heroin, I mean, very, very lethal. So we do know that it's, it's safe. Now this brings us to the psychedelics. And this is um, the, 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 the Psychedelics and Health Research Initiative is, is here at UC San Diego. And this is very situated in a very unique and world-class interdisciplinary context, which is a, a collaboration between uh, psychiatry uh, and the Department of Anesthesiology, uh, 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 our uh, Fadal Zaidan, which does a mindful, med mindfulness meditation, Tim Furnish uh, in the department or is, is collaborating with uh, 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 the Department of Psychiatry. It's very exciting. Um, we, now, we do know that, that chronic pain results in this alteration of neural circuitry. And what that means is that whenever you have chronic unremitting pain, your brain rewires itself. And that can lead to chronic intractable pain. Um, it's very, it becomes very disrupted. Psilocybin, which is a psychedelic, allows the brain to re-enter a state where up by this maladaptive, maladaptive patterns reset. It's actually very similar to the research that Dr. Fadal Zaidan has uh, showed with mindfulness meditation, and that mindfulness meditation allows you to self-induce your uh, into a, a state that allows your brain to rewire itself. And the clinical implications of this is not only with the treatment of chronic pain, but the treatment of addiction and depression and anxiety. Um, and also on the left here, if you look at where this psilocybin fits in, in patients' um, experience, and you compare it to something like uh, amphetamines, it's some of them reported as the single most lifetime experience. So it does put the brain in a, in a very unique state. We are currently conducting studies in phantom limb pain. We, there's a grant that, 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 uh, to support this. However, they are very excited about exploring uh, the use of psilocybin in other chronic contractible conditions, such as chronic uh, regional pain syndrome, fibromyalgia, post-stroke. It's also uh, in, uh, looking into uh, its use in some rehabilitation of patients that have undergone spinal cord injury, stroke, um, and then there's a lot of other combined therapeutic approach, combining it with other therapies that we use to treat chronic pain. Now let's move on to the, to the cannabis. And I have been, uh, I was here in, in um, California in 1996 when uh, the cannabis was legalized. At the time I was in favor of legalizing, but I was on the fence of, gosh, well, we don't know anything about it. How do we use it? Uh, what dose do we use? What's the source? A lot of questions. I didn't jump on the bandwagon at, in the beginning. Uh, but then fast forward to today, we've learned a lot about it, which I will share, share with you. Now understand that the cannabinoid receptor is the, what the receptor that, that THC or the cannabis works on. It's the most widely distributed receptor in our nervous system, throughout the nervous system, both the peripheral nerves, the spinal cord, and the brain. And, and this is important because it, uh, it, it, it it activates these receptors at all of these different levels of the, of the nervous system that modulate pain transmission. At the level of the peripheral nerves, the spinal cord, and even the brain, it activates these descending inhibitory pathways that stop pain transmission from reaching the brain. So it, it's quite an interesting uh, uh, therapeutic. Now, I want to just briefly the, just cover this in the cannabinoid system. This is our own endogenous cannabis system is the way I explain it to my patients. It's an extremely important system. It's there that stimulates, stimulates our appetite. It helps us sleep. It helps us relax. It, it, it's involved in memory and it's there to protect us. Now, the importance of this is that this endocannabinoid system provides us with kind of this homeostasis, but there it may be 
times or, 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 or patients that may have an, a, a, an excess of this system or a deficiency of this system. So an, an example of a deficiency of this system would be maybe related to patients that have fibromyalgia or, or uh, uh, depression or um, uh, uh, migraine headaches, whereas an excess of the system may result in some mental health disorders, such as psychosis or schizophrenia or uh, weight gain, uh, obesity. It's, so it is a, a very system, uh, important system that needs to be balanced. Now, there's also this a lot of mis a lot of hype around CBD and cannabidiol, um, and I just want to make sure you understand the difference between t can cannabidiol and THC. First of all, there are no studies reporting analgesic effects of CBD in humans. All of the studies have been with THC, whereas THC has been shown to be analgesic in humans. Um, CBD and both THC have calming effects. They have anti-inflammatory effects. Um, CBD may increase our own endogenous uh, endocannabinoid system, and both THC and CBD may have a role in treatment of addiction because they both modulate what we call brain dopamine that is involved in, in addiction. The doses of CBD required to reach really true therapeutic effects is probably cost prohibitive. It's in the hundreds of milligrams, whereas THC is in the milligram doses. However, when we combine CBD and THC, we have found that CBD may modulate or reduce some of the psychoactivity seen with THC. So I rarely see patients only use CBD and I rarely have patients only using CBD. We almost always use a, a combination of the two. Uh, the Center for Medicinal, Can Medicinal Cannabis Research has, is, has, uh, was started by funds by, of the state of California. It was started in, in 1999. It's been very effective um, in, in, in done, doing clinical trials. We have done a number of clinical trials in various pain syndromes. All of them have shown beneficial effects of cannabis. Um, uh, uh, but however, these are small studies um, uh, in single center. Now, one study I wanna just highlight this, this experimental pain study that I did in healthy volunteers, I crossed them over to different doses of cannabis and I stung them with capsaicin on their forearm. And what I found is that low doses of, of, of uh, THC had no effect, medium doses reduced pain, high doses actually worsened pain. And the importance of this has been demonstrated in further studies that we did in diabetic neuropathy, where we, we looked at the same dose dependent increase reducing pain. However, when we looked at plasma levels of THC, we saw this inverted U. As THC levels go up, you have a reduction in pain, but then you reach a point where you go on the opposite effect and you'll actually start worsening your pain. And I frequently have patients come to me and we ask them, have you tried medical cannabis? And they may, re the response is not uncommon. Oh yeah, I tried it. I didn't like it. It worsened my pain. I don't want to try it again. The circumstances where they go to the dispensaries, they don't get medical supervision. They get, they're given too high doses of THC and it worsens their pain. If we get them to start over, they often do quite well. So these are the dosing guidelines we use at UC San Diego, and this is based on years of experience. We recommend a self-titration. Patients adapt do dosing to balance pain relief with side effects. The key is to go slow, start low and go slow. We op uh, the most common is, is, is tinctures or edibles. We start with very low milligram doses of THC, at about maybe a half to one milligram per dose and gradually increase over the next uh, 10 to 14 days. We usually start with a 20 to one ratio of CBD to THC, but at nighttime, we usually go to a one to one ratio because we wanna bump up that THC because what we find is that the THC is a great, uh, it induces a very health and restful sleep state. Patients usually develop a, a tolerance to the psychoactive effects of cannabis uh, with, without re losing the beneficial effects. Um, now, there's also some T THC mediated side effects such as fatigue and, and tachycardia and dizziness. This is usually avoidable if we start very low and we try to treat it very slow. Understand less can be more. Lower doses are often more effective than the higher doses, and it's because of this biphasic effects between low and high doses of both CBD and THC. 
So that's my talk, and I will hand it back over to Dr. Brunner. Thank you all, everyone. This is really a great discussion. There are a lot of questions about um, addiction and about um, how addiction is related to pain treatment. Um, let me start with an easy one for Dr. Wallace. <laughs> I'll start with a softball. It says, talk about, I don't know if this is how easy it is, talk about um, osteoarthritis in the spine and pain treatment options. And if you don't like to answer it, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask Stephen to follow. <laughs> now I'll start with, with uh, so I, I look at it as, 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 as even Dr. Garfin pointed out, there is, it's more of a kind of a pain treatment continuum. You want to start with, with, with more conservative and, 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 and simple treatments and you work your way through the continuum to more invasive. And so for spine pain, I, I think that the mainstay of treatment is, is exercise and, 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 and movement and, and, and physical therapy and um, minimize medications. I don't think there are a lot of good medications to treat pain in general, unfortunately. And, and so, and then we will move to in, in our clinic because what I focus on is, is we do injections. And, uh, we will, I think that there's a misconception of over using injections to treat spine pain because they think, well, it's not a cure. It, it, it's not gonna fix the problem. But what we're looking for with injections is a long relief. If I, can, if I can demonstrate that somebody gets three months of relief from a single injection, we're onto something. I can continue to do that for the, for the rest of their life. And then there's a point where I have to hand them over to Dr. Garfin and that there's, uh, they're, they're, they've re failed my conservative therapies. And then it's time for them to be looking at more invasive therapies. I don't know if you wanna comment, Dr. Garvin. Please, Steve. Yeah, let me, let me if, I, if I can, just, uh, one, one is, and, and there are a number of pre-questions about osteoarthritis of the spine. I just sort of wanna clarify that a bit. Please. It, we don't know, that almost everybody over age 60 has radiographic evidence of osteoarthritis of the spine, whether they hurt or don't. So we don't know the cause of most pure low back pain, which is why we treat leg pain so well, because we can find the cause on an MRI scan. We can find the pinched nerves and address it. Uh, there have been a number of studies in young people like age 30, asymptomatic, one third of them have abnormal MRIs. They're asymptomatic, they don't have pain. So I, I'm just sort of, and as you get into, like I said, 60, almost 100% of asymptomatic people have evidence of arthritis. So I don't know that that's the cause. Um, and that's why our non-operative treatment is, always, is not so good because we can't target it very well. Sometimes with injections, we can target the cause of the pain with steroids, with burning the nerve. Um, but in general, we don't. And Mark also mentioned exercise. We know that aerobic exercise, um, <clears throat> if you can get it to 60% of your cardiac maximum for 30 minutes, three to four times a week will increase your endorphins 100% which is the best pain relief you, you can get better than Mark's stuff that he gives you by mouth. <laughs> and, and also your, your, your endocannabinoid system, it stimulates. It stimulates natural <laughs> cannabis, yep. And it also regrows neurons in the part of the brain that regulate emotion. So it can help with mood and depression a lot as well, exercise is outstanding. So they, as I said before, and I'll just emphasize it again, and thank you for the comments is, this is not a pain that says stop. This is a pain that says ouch. It's hard to get started with aerobic exercise because it hurts, but aerobics can include bicycle riding, it can include swimming, it can include, include treadmill and walking, it, and it can be jogging. Uh, thank you. There, there are a lot of questions about um, fentanyl. Um, Carl, do you, do you want to say why, why is fentanyl so deadly? Why is there a public health crisis about fentanyl? What's changed? That because that was virtually unheard of until fairly recently. Interesting, because fentanyl really was not a part of the heroin supply. So there's all kinds of fascinating things about how drugs get distributed and which regions of the world they come from. And, you know, if they come up through Mexico versus if they come through Central America. What happens with fentanyl is that when um, very industrious business people realize that you had a much more potent 
uh, product that you could just actually ship through the mail um, from synthetic laboratories that didn't require nearly as much difficulty in, in distribution, that this would be, you know, potentially good for their business, although there's a limit because it is so potent, it's much harder to titrate. And so the risk of overdose and using too much is, is much higher. And so, so there's a balance between the risk of overdose, which not to put this in, in minimizing terms, but isn't good for business um, versus the, the cheaper, more readily available, easier distribution. And so, and so it's a fine balance, um, but it's very, very clear that it, maps on quite well that when we saw this huge dramatic increase in opioid overdose deaths, it was very much linked to when we started getting many more seizures and, and finding fentanyl in the supplies. Um, while you're thinking, um, let me ask you another question, Carla. Um, the, 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 um, Joe Sherman um, typed in that um, if only 10% of people get treatment and the 70% relapse rate, it's clear that um, we need other approaches, other approaches. And he wanted your recommendations on things to think about, and particularly asked about um, naltrexone implants. So, so 70% relapse rates depends on what you're talking about. Is that, you know, if somebody has gone through a residential program or a rehab program, if, is that somebody who wasn't offered medications that we know can be really helpful? Um, you know, so we, relapse rates are really context dependent. And so um, we see much, much better rates than that when patients are provided medications. And in fact, the relapse rates um, for methadone and buprenorphine are among some of the best um, when you look at relapse rates, for example, of hypertension or diabetes with, with those kinds of medications. Um, but I do agree that the fact that only, you know, a very small percentage of the people who might benefit from therapies or medications get it is a huge problem. And one of the new therapies that, it's not new, naltrexone has been around for a long time as a medication. Um, it doesn't work very well orally because people just don't take it. It doesn't really help very much with cravings. In the United States, we have a once monthly injectable version. And so that's really been a game changer. Um, and it actually does help a lot with reducing cravings. The, the questions, the pre-questions um, talked about some implants, which are available. They've been studied in Europe and Australia. Um, they're available elsewhere in the world, not in the United States. The advantage of the implants is it gets you a little bit longer than the once monthly injection. Um, so like two to six months, depending on whether they have the beads or the rods or different things like that. And so it's a different modality that gets you a little bit more time, which is great, um, but similar efficacy to the once monthly option that we have available now. Thank you. Um, here's, here's one for, um, for Ruth, actually two for Ruth. What have been the major advances in surgical anesthesia um, recently? What have been the major changes? Yeah, um, so I would I would say you know something that um, I I talked about initially was really approaching um, um, pain from a multimodal perspective. Um, you know, it's very traditional that when a patient goes back to surgery, you ply them with some fentanyl um, and keep them under uh, anesthesia gas, and you know the, both of those things um, have have issues. But now with the multimodal approach, we can do a lot of blocks um, with local anesthetic. We can um, give um, uh, things like um, gabapentin, um, which will help um, decrease the chance of post-operative pain. We can run them on ketamine or lidocaine drips, propofol in conjunction with, with anesthesia. So really that multimodal approach. And then um, specifically here at UCSD, one of our major advances is the acute pain service which follows patients post-operatively and really helps the surgeons um, decide like um, proper dosing um, for opioids and other post-op medications. So our team may keep someone on a lidocaine drip um, post-operatively instead of plying them with, um, with opioids. I know a lot of our patients who have had breast surgery will get blocks and um, some of them will go home without even having had um, any type of, of opioid at all. So that's really um, one of the biggest advances that we've, we've had recently um, in, uh, you know, surgical anesthesia. Yeah, I, I noticed that as, as an impartial observer, all of a sudden all these complicated surgeries we've done by regional blocks. Which yes. Are, we're not done when, when, I, <laughs> when I trained. Um, what, <laughs> what changed technically that, 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 that you could do that when before required general anesthesia? 
um, something called an ultrasound. <laughs> so um, I'm missing something. Yeah, yeah, that ultrasound, um, you know, has gotten to be um, so uh, wonderful and allowing us to see vessels and the nerves. Um, they have new needles that will you can see under ultrasound that will really allow you to guide them. And then, of course, surgeons and their techniques, um, you know, so they've gotten faster in a lot of the things that they're doing or they're using um, more minimally invasive um, uh, machinery and techniques that allow us to also do this. So it's um, both, um, like I said, one of the good things about being an anesthesiologist is that we have um, the ability to collaborate with all these different departments. And so you often see that, like, for example, we can do a lot of outpatient surgery um, under a regional anesthesia, people who would normally have had to come into the OR um, at Jacobs, maybe stay overnight. Now we can do it under block and they can go home same day at the Coleman outpatient pavilion. So really allowing us to have um, more options for our patients. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. Mark, there are a couple questions about um, if you wanna try alternative ways of, of controlling pain like cannabis or um, psilocybin, how do you go about that? So psilocybin, unfortunately, it's too early to be using it. It's, it's not advanced enough that we can offer that to patients just yet. We, we have a ways to go with the research. Now with cannabis, we've come a long way though. And um, I have, so the approach that we take is I evaluate the patients to make sure they're appropriate for it. Um, and then if I feel they're appropriate, then I give them the authorization. Now the key to cannabis is dosing. You have to make sure you dose it right. So unfortunately it's complicated and I don't have the time to sit down with the patient and go through the dosing and, and, and also keep up with the quality control for the cannabis. And so we have an affiliate with us who is a doctor of naturopathic medicine that does the dosing consultations for us and then directs the patients to the appropriate products with specific dosing. And then they follow up with me and I, and I, and I uh, assess their response and make sure that uh, you know, what, uh, their side effects and then document it in their medical record. It is a therapeutic and it should be a part of their medical record. And then we just monitor them and we continue to, to follow them um, and make sure they're using it appropriately and giving the appropriate response. Thank you. Um, Steve, there's, there's, there's several questions. I don't know how to organize them, but they, they basically are asking um, about post-surgical pain and treatment with um, narcotics and, and like, and, and at what point are you treating the post-surgical pain and at what point are you worried about an addiction? Uh, it's a tough question. <laughs> um, I, I don't, and Mark can comment on it. Um, I, okay. I don't, I, I'm not uncomfortable giving narcotics for six weeks or two months um, for the big fusions I do. I, I, I would be for a herniated disc. Um, and, and the only way you know not to do it, not to take it, is to, is to cut out a dose here or cut out a dose there. You can usually add Tylenol. Um, if we don't fuse the spine, uh, that, then we can really dose much better with, um, again, over-the-counter meds. So we often recommend, once they get beyond where I think the, the narcotic, they're really having narcotic pain, and maybe just taking the pills because I think they have to, um, is removing doses and start doing, and I'm not telling anybody in this audience what to do because you, if you get stomach problems or liver problems, um, but I think anti-inflammatories are pretty safe for four months uh, without getting things checked. So I would do two to three ibuprofen and then three hours later Tylenol and then three hours later ibuprofen. So you have something every three hours that literally is over the counter. And I think that can obviate a lot of narcotic use, but, but, but the only way not to know is to not take it. Often people stay on it at night a little longer because they hurt more at night, no. uh, probably because of steroid cycling um, and they want to sleep. And I, I don't have much of an issue with that, but there was also a comment I saw about m many pain doctors are, um, Department of Justice is looking at because they're taking such fine records. It doesn't mean they did anything wrong. They're just giving it out. Um, and, and so I tend not to use very much of it because I don't want the feds looking at me and I leave it to the pain specialist. So I think I get a little more of a pass. I think they get a, 
a little more of a pass. Mark, you want to follow up with it? Yeah, so, so I think that the, 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 what I see is the most common reason patients remain on opioids, and I, I see a lot of them in the clinic, and I try to do detective work and go back to when were they first started. Most of them were started for surgery. And then five years later, they're still on them. So I think the key is, is that, and it's not, it's their fault. It's not the patient's fault. Don't get me wrong. And they, but I think the key is, is this discussion needs to be made with the patient prior to the surgeries, prior to that event and make them understand that yes, you are going to need opioids to treat this severe pain, but this is the time period. And we are going to take you off of this opioid. And this is why we're going to take you off of this opioid. So understand that there's not a fine line between treating pain and addiction. Oftentimes there's an overlap and there's just gray area. They have very real pain, but then they also have a, an underlying addiction problem. And this is where we, we call on our addiction, addiction specialist to help us out and to help tease this out uh, for, for, with the patient. So it's a very, very complicated area. And I, I think that that's true. And I have a lot of patients who really have had problems from opioids. Opioids are very powerful and they cause problems and they still have pain. Um, and it's really a challenge to manage that. But the other, um, one of the questions that was asked in, in the pre thing was um, whether or not, sorry, I just lost the, lost the question there, but um, about how do you differentiate pain from withdrawal versus pain? Right, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we know that even people who've never had pain, opioid withdrawal is incredibly painful. Um, for patients who've never had a chronic pain problem, they talk about break bone pain, severe muscle cramps, musculoskeletal joint pain. And so it's an incredibly painful thing to have the opioid withdrawal itself. And so that can be a really hard part to manage as you're trying to transition somebody off of something that's causing them problems, the opioids through the pain of both the withdrawal and their underlying disorder. And so we use a lot of therapy and other things to try to help manage that as best as we can. Um, here's a question um, for um, Ruth. It's sort of re relevant to what we're talking about. Is, is there any way of, of objectively quantifying pain, of, of, of determining what amount of pain is normal, you know, what amount of pain is just, is just is, um, necessary for intervention? Mm -hmm. Oh, 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 if only, you know, um, my favorite, my favorite thing is when you ask a patient, you know, like, um, you know, on a scale of one to 10, how do you rate your pain? And they're like, it's a hundred. And you're like, okay. Um, it, you have no way of really, uh, uh, distinguishing what that is because we're on this scale of, you know, one to 10 and, and they're experiencing something that we, we can't understand. It's, it's an incredible difficult position to be in as a physician. And you really have to, you know, the one thing about medicine is well, and what is important about the concept of precision medicine in the future is being able to look at every patient as an individual. You know, some patients come in with, with a whole bunch of underlying pain and on a whole bunch of drugs, and you know that you're gonna have to give them a lot more during surgery than you would give someone else. And then you're figuring out how we're gonna take care of that pain post-operatively so they don't have a terrible experience or stay longer in the hospital and develop pneumonia and have complications. So there's really no way to just say, you know, there's a scale here that's very easy um, for us to, to distinguish one pain over the other. Um, but this is why work, working with uh, informatics, predictive analytics, we may be able to start fine tuning this in the future, but right now, we're all doing the best we can. Thank you so much. Um, so our time is over. I, I always want to end on time because I know everyone is so busy. But I, I want to thank everyone. But, but it was really a great discussion. You can tell by the number of questions and the interactions. This is really an, an interesting topic. And there are many other areas we haven't um, done yet. And, and we can maybe do this again sometime soon. But I want to thank you all. And I want to thank the audience. And I want to thank um, the advancement people for arranging this. Thanks, everyone.